I am going to get started. Hi, my name is Dakota. Most of you interacted with me before this to let me know you were coming or if you had any questions. I'm the Development Associate from Citizens Union, and this is our breakfast brief on the census now during the time of COVID-19. If you are just, if you could just mute your mic. If you are on a dialing phone, you hit star six. If you're on your cell phone, there should be a microphone that you can click to turn it off. And if you are on the Cisco WebEx, you can just go and highlight the screen with your cursor and there should be a little circle icon with a microphone on it. And you can mute yourself by clicking that. It would be greatly appreciated so we can hear all of our speakers today. And if you are using the Cisco WebEx application, there is a chat option. If you hit the little speaking bubble, if you have questions at the end of the presentation. All right, Betsy, if you would like to introduce. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I, I hope everybody is safe and, and healthy and not going too crazy. Uh, it's Betsy Gottbaum, Executive Director of Citizens Union, and I'm very, very pleased to be able to introduce uh, Julie Menon, who is the Executive Director of the Census, and Amy Torres from the Chinese American Planning Council. Uh, they will give a presentation which, from uh, my, the indications of what they told me yesterday, we have, we have some really interesting and good news. So Julie, take it away. Thank you so much, Betsy. It's great to be with all of you here. I do have good news. I mean, obviously, in this time of COVID, uh, where we are all grappling with this real crisis for our city and our country, we want to make sure that people understand the importance of the census, and we want to make sure that people understand that health care funding, and particularly funding for hospitals and Medicaid and CHIP, um, is directly linked to the census. So I'm going to give you an update on what we're doing in light of COVID and also give you some good news, I hope you will think, in terms of our numbers. So I'm going to go right into the presentation. Um, first of all, it's important to know by context what we're comparing ourselves to when we're really looking at 2010 and how we did as a city over 10 years ago. So to just walk through these numbers briefly. In 2010, across the country, the initial return rate was 76%. So this is a self-response rate before the door knocking. New York City, you can see, had a really anemic response to the census of 61.9%, and parts of the city, such as Brooklyn, were at 55.5%. And quite frankly, we had tracks that were in the 30s and 40s. So we really um, had a very subpar performance in 2010. Now, moving forward to the next slide. Okay, so how is New York City currently doing? Um, first of all, you can see, and actually, could we go back to the, the prior slide for one minute, please? As we jumped ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, someone's got some music on, if they could please mute that. Thank you so much. So you can see that one week out, this is one week out in 2010, 10 years ago, you can see that New York City was at a 6% response rate, 10 points behind the US as a country at 16%. So now I want to give you where we are one week and a few days out. So let's go to the next slide. So right now, one week and a few days out, we're at 15.1% as a city. Uh, and we're actually narrowing the gap between where New York City is performing and the national average, because the national average is at 21.2%. To be at 15.1% one week and a few days out is really an incredibly strong uh, initial performance, particularly in light of the fact that we in New York City are literally the epicenter of COVID across the country. So. We're really emboldened by these numbers. I'm giving you the borough breakdown as well. Um, and now we'll move on to the next slide. So in terms of the timeline, um, I wanna give a couple of different updates. Many of you are familiar, 
But a few updates that are important to note is the mayor sent a letter on March 18th um, to the U.S. Census Bureau director urging for an extension of the self-response window. So to refresh everyone's memory, initially pre-COVID, the self-response window, and I should say not just pre-COVID, but it still is this point because the Census Bureau has not made a change yet. The self-response window is July 31st. They did, I will say, extend it by two weeks to mid-August. So the U.S. Census Bureau has extended self-response to August 14th. We have urged them to extend it to September 30th uh, to allow for more time for us to be able to do our work and for the U.S. Census Bureau to do their work. Okay, next slide. So what are we doing? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through what we've been doing for the past year and then some changes that we've made in light of COVID. So we've been working at the city census office on this really unprecedented citywide campaign. It's the first of its kind that the city has ever done. And it revolves around a community-based New York City Complete Count Fund, uh, a field campaign, a multilingual micro-targeted messaging campaign, and a very in-depth and robust agency and partnership engagement plan. In terms of our grants, we had a $19 million grants program specifically giving $16 million to 157 community organizations on the ground that are trusted voices in their neighborhood. These are groups that have worked with their respective communities for many years. They serve all 245 neighborhoods in the city, and they're working in over 80 different languages and everything from social services provision to healthcare to education, arts and culture, advocacy, and many others. Um, in light of COVID, what we have done is we've held um, three different conference calls to provide very specific guidance to all 157 organizations so that they we can work with them to switch their strategies in light of COVID. We have shared many resources. We've got tech training tools in light of COVID webinars. We've obviously suspended all door-to-door -door and street canvassing for all of our grantees. Moving from any kind of events, which we're clearly not having, and any kind of door knocking, which we're also not having, to instead our text banking and our phone banking technology. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and we've also given flexibility uh, to the awardees in light of COVID. Okay, next slide, please. Our field strategy. So let me just say, because I'm being asked in the past couple of days, you know, why do I think that we are seeing strong numbers in New York? And I, I, it's honestly a very long answer, but certainly key and, and foremost is I really believe that through this uh, citywide partnership we have, we have done extensive work on the census for the past year. So our office has um, worked to host uh, with our partners over 500 different events. These 500 events are largely town hall meetings and large scale meetings that we've had all year long about the census. We've had over 1,200 New Yorkers attend one of our, um, uh, we've done these teach-ins where we teach people how to train the trainer and those have really mushroomed and blossomed as our teach-ins all over the city. We have over 6,000 volunteers who are our, our core volunteers that we've been working with throughout the year. Now, in light of COVID, uh, you can see in the blue box how we've changed some of our strategies. So we have now moved to textathons. So we were always going to do textathons, but we were going to initially pre-COVID host textathons, which we did on March 22nd and yesterday. Initially, these were going to be textathon events where groups all over the city would work with us and have events where they were texting. We move those to individuals from their home doing textathons. So we had over 600 volunteers yesterday and today, I'm sorry, Sunday and Monday at our textathon. Uh, and we reached out to hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers through our textathons. Uh, and they were really incredibly impactful. Um, we've also been hosting and participating in teletown hall meetings and webinars. We did one with Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez last weekend that was really well attended. And now we're also um, moving to our phone banking stage as well. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so our media strategy. So before COVID, we had announced an $8 million advertising campaign, including $3 million for community and ethnic media. We did many, many ethnic media roundtables specifically targeted to community and ethnic media. We had did um, various uh, public service announcements with Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Lin-Manuel Miranda that we had already released. And then we initially were going to do a very significant subway and bus ad buy uh, that was going to go for eight weeks. In light of COVID, we completely renegotiated our um, media buy to convert our subway and bus ads instead to digital and TV and print. So we have done that. Our digital uh, campaign, we're able to really micro-target it. So literally, we can make split-second decisions on if an ad is resonating or not. And then we move it out if it's not resonating. And it allows us to micro-target in specific communities. We launched a TV campaign um, a week and a half ago with Univision that is really tailored to mobilize Spanish-speaking communities to take the census. And we have our print and digital ads in over 16 languages. Um, and right now we're running ads in, in 180 different uh, community and media outlets right now. Okay, um, partnership strategy. So before COVID, uh, we did a tremendous amount of work activating all of our city agencies on their census strategies. We worked with over 1,000 houses of worship on census, we've been working with the private sector, we've been working with labor, with community groups. We also invested in the city's public library system. Initially, initially we slated to have over 300 pop-up sites where those that lacked access uh, to broadband could fill out the census. In light of that, we suspended, in light of COVID, of course, all census pop-up sites. We have sent um, email blasts uh, to all city employees, so to the over 350,000 city employees so that they could fill the census out. Uh, we have sent out thousands and thousands of blasts to employers, to labor use unions. These are member to member contact to community groups so that um, we have sent this blast out really citywide. We've had the library shift all of their resources online um, and then we will be sending very soon uh, building flyers to be posted in all NYCHA buildings, and we're working very closely on our NYCHA strategy. And we're also putting those at food pickup stations. Um, our shelter agreement. So we entered into a really unprecedented agreement to count the homeless. One of the problems we found that happened in 2010 with counting the homeless in the shelters is that the Census Bureau, the US Census Bureau does something called group quarters when they're counting both university population, students and dorms, as well as the homeless who are living in shelters. And one of the problems with group quarters that happened in 2010 is oftentimes the US Census Bureau was not making contact early enough in the process, or they weren't connecting with the right person on the administrative level. So on the university side, we've connected them, um, the U.S. Census Bureau, to all of the universities. We did that uh, really uh, back in January. We started that contact. For the homeless shelter agreement, we entered into an agreement with the New York City Department of Social Services and the U.S. Census Bureau that basically facilitates the transfer of demographic data. Um, so what basically this means is that Initially, what happened in 2010 is the U.S. Census Bureau would try to make contact with the administrator of DSS's homeless shelters across the city. Oftentimes that contact didn't happen or it happened too late or the U.S. Census Bureau was not allowed into the shelter. So now we've really obviated the need for that because instead the administrator of all the DSS shelters is directly giving administrative data on every single homeless person living in the shelter so that no one is overlooked. Okay, we're going to move to the next slide. Um, so the best way just for all of you who are messaging out on the census, and we really encourage all of you who have not yet done this, please use your social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, to send a message out to all of your contacts to fill the census out, is to say, let's think of the census as 10 questions that take under 10 minutes that yet determine the next 10 years of your life. And as I mentioned from the outset, in light of COVID, we really think it's so important to remind New Yorkers about the linkage 
between the census and healthcare funding, funding to our hospitals, funding for Medicaid, funding for children's health insurance, and the fact that the New York City Health Department utilizes census data when they're making decisions in emergencies. So this data could not be more relevant. So in terms of um, this, these are just census 101 basics, but I, I still get this question every single day. People ask me um, who fills the census at. Any member of the household uh, can complete the form for the whole household. So that's really incredibly important to know. <clears throat> and next slide. Um, all of you, I'm sure, have this information, but we're just going to include it again. If you haven't filled the census out, it couldn't be easier. You don't need to wait to get the computer code in the form. You literally just go to my2020census.gov. You put in your name and address. If you don't have the computer PIN number, you just click on I don't have the computer PIN number, and you can fill it out. Uh, we want to make sure that New Yorkers know that you can also fill it out by phone. A great way for us to reach New Yorkers who do not have broadband access by phone banking and encouraging them to call the toll free number. There's actually a number in 13 different languages. We included on this slide the number in English and the number in Spanish. And we really are doing a pledge where we're encouraging everyone to complete the count in their own neighborhood to join us, as I mentioned at the top. We have neighborhood organizing census committees. We have over 6,000 volunteers. Um, if you need more information, please come to our website, which is nyc.gov slash census. We're going to be doing additional textathons like the one that we did um, both Sunday and Monday. So if you want to join us on one of our textathons, please check our website. If you uh, want to follow, I send out updates every single day on how the city is doing. So please, if you can, you can, um, and I can ask me any question on Twitter, on Instagram. So I've included my information there if you want to stay in touch. And our hashtag is GetCountedNYC. Okay. And I'm, I know that we have time for questions, but again, I really want to thank Citizens Union for putting this together. They've been a, a great partner uh, from the get-go with us in terms of um, helping to communicate the importance of the census, and we really, really appreciate their partnership. Thank you. much, Julie. At this time, we will move over to Amy Torres, if you want to start your presentation now. Thank you so much, Amy. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Amy Torres. I am the Director of Policy and Advocacy at CPC, the Chinese American Planning Council. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here alongside the NYC Census Office, and I want to give special thanks to Citizens Union for making sure that we could continue this briefing albeit in a new format. Um, I think we're all responding to a changing landscape and um, it's really wonderful to be able to continue this conversation with all of you this morning. Um, I'd like to introduce a little bit about CPC and who we are and the work that we've been doing to date. So CPC was formed in 1965. We are a social services organization that believes in social change. In 1965, CPC was formed in direct response to the end of the Chinese exclusion years. It was during the era of the Civil Rights Act, the Immigration and Naturalization Act, um, and our services were formed in direct response to um, really a vacuum of services for Asian Americans who were, who were coming into New York City and making their home here. CPC has since grown to become the nation's largest social services organization for Asian Americans, um, serving 60,000 low income immigrant and Asian American Pacific Islander New Yorkers. We provide services in family support, education and community and economic empowerment. So whether that's after school programming, youth leadership and development, career services, adult education, adult literacy, senior services, we serve the full spectrum of um, family support and community empowerment from grandchildren to grandparents and everything in between. So CPC first started engaging in um, social change work in 2017. Um, our policy and public affairs division is a uh, 
recent addition to CPC's scope of services and programs. Every year since 2017, we've been um, issuing an annual survey where we collect feedback from the community and feedback from staff that drive our advocacy um, priorities for the year ahead. So we issue this feedback, we then look and see um, what areas of um, the organization people respond from issues um, and how we can leverage that into our advocacy and policy work. We understand that as a social services agency, um, there's a lot of need that we're meeting in the community, but there's also a need for us to be represented in decision making and uh, policy spaces. Um, so we use this community feedback to form our agendas. We also make sure that we're hosting issue forums with both staff and community members. That can happen um, from everything like a webinar like this that we're having. Um, we do round tables with our community members as well, issue forums so that we're really talking deeply about the policy implications and what the potential impacts would be on CPC's communities. Um, and then we also encourage our young people and our community members to get involved in issues that they care about themselves. Um, our civic engagement work includes everything from voter education and outreach to, um, you know, engaging civically with City Hall, with the state legislature. We really believe firmly that you don't need to be a citizen to be civically engaged. Um, so we encourage phone campaigns, um, text campaigns, which once we talk about our, our modified census work, um, I'll, I'll share some more details on. Um, but we really believe strongly in that in order to engage uh, people civically, um, we also need to be civic leaders ourselves. So we try to build that in house wherever possible. Um, and then we also have annual advocacy events. So we have uh, an advocacy day at City Hall. We have one up in Albany. Um, and for those following along on the um, webinar and the presentation, uh, we have some pictures from some advocacy events um, that we've had over the last couple years. Uh, I've included one of my favorite pictures, which is a few of our staff and our executive director joking around with Senator John Liu. Um, we really believe firmly, just, just as we believe that you don't need to be a citizen to be civically engaged, um, we also believe that engaging in advocacy does not need to be serious. You don't need to be an expert. Um, we as community members have so much lived experience um, that we contribute our expertise by just sharing our story and bringing that story to um, decision-making spaces. So, when CPC thinks about our census work, um, we are relying a lot on our past experience with previous census cycles. In 2010, CPC was a federal census uh, response center. Um, starting a couple of years ago, when it was becoming clear that the federal funding for that type of assistance was not going to come through. So, we, we were looking at what the inclusion was for 2020. We realized that it was very unlikely that they would do these, these uh, response centers in the same way. So CBC joined um, the New York Counts 2020 coalition to really um, form a city and state strategy to make sure that community-based outreach and education was a strong part of local and state planning for census 2020 since we did not think that um, that was going to happen at the federal level in the way that it had in years past. Um, what we brought to that space was, again, our experience with previous census cycles. We had done um, walk-in uh, self-response assistance and guidance. Um, what we learned in 2010 was that even when language, even when materials were provided in language, there were just still so many questions because of um, people's limited familiarity with the census um, and their concerns about um, how to respond, their privacy considerations. But what we also realized in 2010 is that there's just a big gap in um, literacy, even when materials are provided in native language. So mail assistance, um, letter translation and support is something that we still offer to this day and that grew out of our census work. 
Um, so as we started engaging with our coalition partners um, in this advocacy campaign, we really led with the um, really wanted to lead with our experience that community members need that in person interaction um, to feel confident to fill out their census. As we were doing that, um, the news of the citizenship question dropped. So our advocacy pivoted pretty strongly into informing the community um, about the urgency of the census and educating um, ourselves and our community members that we know the data from the census is safe. We know that this question was uh, an intentional distraction to make sure that communities like our community here in New York City did not respond, were fearful to respond, and were subsequently under-resourced and underrepresented for the decade ahead. Um, so we were thrilled, um, as everyone was, to see that the citizenship question was struck down. It is not on the 2020 census, but we were also very excited that that advocacy movement actually galvanized a lot of people to um, understand the importance of census 2020 and that even after this summer, once the question was removed, there was still really um, strong enthusiasm to get communities counted, um, make sure that people felt safe and secure and confident in filling out their census. And um, that has led us to the work that we're in today. So um, originally our plan was, and our plan had been um, up until very recently to embed and overlay census work onto the three program and service areas that CBC provides, our education services, so really deeply embedding um, census awareness and census self-response into our education classes, whether that's adult literacy, whether that's after school programming for children, um, to layer it on top of our family support services so that when people are coming in for walk-in services, um, providing gentle nudges and reminders about filling out the census or directing people to a, a self-response pop-up site. Um, and then also in our community and economic empowerment program. So if we have a leadership development program, activating um, young people or activating um, folks in our careers training programs to be able to be ambassadors to the census, to develop public speaking experience so that they can go back to their communities or they can develop a, a workshop or a um, presentation for the public on census and its importance. Um, we all know we're in a very different reality now with COVID-19. Um, so while CPC, while a majority of CPC sites are closed, CPC itself is still open and is still in service to the community. Um, so we are still open in our essential services, whether it's our uh, residential facilities, our provision of meals to seniors and our Meals on Wheels program. So we are still working through providing those gentle nudges in the provision of those essential services, whether that's flyers with every meal that goes out, whether it's making sure that there's um, census literature and that the staff that are distributing those meals are urging people to fill out the census, um, and that in our residential facilities that there is information so people can self-respond at home. Um, and then for the remainder of our services, which are uh, you know on pause, we are we still have CPC's phone lines open, so we've directed um, some of the lines back to staff's work cell phones so that they can answer questions from the community. Um, of course, reminding them about urgent closures, um, things that they should know about related to you know other other closures as part of the um, New York pause. Um, but also reminding them that while CPC remains closed, that there are still other ways for them to seek help and support, um, and that we're urging and nudging people to fill out the census. And we're also hearing from our community members, especially those that we're more regularly in touch with, ways that we can engage with them on new platforms. Um, so across all of the services that I mentioned before, we do have um, general contact information from our community members that we capture during the intake process, whether that's the application when they sign up for class or whether it's um, engaging with them through social media. So we know that we have um, some active con contact information with a majority of our community members. And now during this, you know, new and uncertain period of COVID-19, 
Um, we are using that same contact information to conduct phone surveys. So we're making sure that we're following up with community members. Um, for some of our programs, it's daily. For other programs, it's biweekly. We're calling community members, hearing um, concerns from them, trying to direct them to questions and nudging them about Census 2020, letting them know how they can fill it out and also capturing if they've already filled it out. Um, we have also been partnering with non-English media to digest announcements on a daily basis. So every day at 3 p.m. we do a synopsis of um, any updates that have happened at the federal, state, and city level. Uh, we make sure to translate it, provide phone numbers, um, provide website links so that our partners in ethnic media can then publish that and put it into the press um, because we know we can't have the in-person interaction, but we can still serve as a partner um, to our media allies and make sure that everyone can up to date information. Um, this is particularly important for us because we know that even since December, um, there's been pretty, uh, and there have been escalating incidences of bias and discrimination against Asian Americans and against Chinese Americans in particular. So really making sure that we're um, leading with accurate information, making sure that we're uh, directing community members who may be fearful not only of um, spread of COVID-19, but of potential retaliation that they may face when they go out in public. Um, and then through that, we're also directing people to fill out the census as well. So making sure that in each one of those media announcements, that we're including the links to um, census self-response online or by phone. Um, and we're engaging in, as Julie mentioned, the text out the count campaigns um, and the eventual phone banking campaigns as well. So we know that um, you know, through texting, through phone banking, through flyering, um, calling people over the phone, this is not the original plan that we had. Um, our goal throughout all of this is that these methods of modified census outreach, they're certainly not going to reach everyone. They're not going to compel the very hardest of hardest to count. But our hope is that with this extended census timeline that Julie mentioned earlier, what we do have a responsibility to do is make sure that right now we are convincing the absolute maximum of people that we can reach through phone, that we can reach through texting. Um, that we can reach through press and media or that we can reach through flyering, making sure that once we are, you know, through the pause period, through the social distancing period, that once that happens, all of our attention can be laser focused on the hardest to reach communities and that we can really make sure that that time is spent less on the ground softening work that we've done during this time and really, really hyper-focused on um, the communities with low self-response rates. Being able to monitor um, the, uh, the Bureau's own self-response um, reports will be very helpful in guiding that work, um, but until we get to the point where we can be back in the community and having those in-person interactions, the ones that are the most compelling, the ones that are the most convincing, um, we're really trying to innovate on the access that we have now. Um, and so this has, uh, I think where, where I'll end is sort of the silver line, lining of this is that as we've been doing these surveys with our community members and reaching out to folks online or over the phone, we've been hearing about some new and innovative ways that our community members want to be engaged while we are all, um, you know, social distancing and um, in this period of, of closure. Um, so we've heard a lot from our young people um, who are very excited about engaging on social media. We've been asked, you know, how do we make something go viral on Instagram or can we do a live feed on um, gaming platforms? Um, and they have really come to us with very exciting ideas, a lot of enthusiasm. Um, and what's exciting for CPC is that we know that these young people, because we're a multi-generational social services organization, we know that these young people are often the primary translators for their families. They may be second generation or, or 1.5 generation. So they are often the ones assisting their parents with mail, assisting their parents with navigating online systems or, or systems that may not be in their native language. 
So if we can really use this time now to deeply activate the people who are excited, who are able to engage this work in this work and who may be able to reach those hard to count communities because they are already part of that family network, they are already living together. Um, they're just a more helpful partner with us um, during this time that we're motivate, modifying our, um, our services and our approach. Um, so that is it for my presentation. I'm going to uh, switch over and then I know there's also time for questions and reactions. Um, so I'll switch it over to the NYC Census and Citizens Union team. Julie as well, those were extremely informative. I'm so glad we were able to still do this today. Um, a few of you sent in questions previously, either over the weekend or last week. And so now we will take time to address those and either Amy or Julie can answer. So the first one is a three-parter. Is it possible to postpone the census? or to keep the count open to continue it next year. What are the legal and logistical considerations in such a decision? I'll turn it over to you. Sure, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, so I'll put my legal hat on. So Article 1 of the Constitution specifies that the count um, must happen every 10 years. In terms of legally postponing the census, Certainly, the self-response period could be delayed, which is what the mayor urged and what I urged, and we've sent this letter to the U.S. Census Bureau urging that. In terms, however, uh, because I've, I've literally received a ton of people who have asked me, can the census be canceled? Can it be delayed past this year? The count must be sent to Washington uh, by the end of December. So that must happen. Um, however, we could certainly have the self-response enumeration period uh, delayed uh, till the fall, which is what the mayor has urged just at the end of September. And just to be clear, and I mentioned this earlier in the presentation, I want to make sure everyone knows the U.S. Census Bureau has extended the self-response period to August 14th. Amy, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think um, the only thing that I would add is that, um, you know, we've been hearing the same question from our volunteers, our advocates that are engaged in census work. And so, you know, in addition to the statutory deadlines and, and the um, responsibilities that the Bureau has that Julie mentioned, um, we need to also think longer term of what what a delay in information could mean for New York City. Um, so after the self-response period closes, the Bureau does have to do a check of that data, does have to do a, a cleaning of that data, um, whether that's matching through administrative record, looking at multiple uh, responses, cleaning that up. Um, and for New York City, the implications mean that in 2021, in 2022, when we have um, the next set of state races, this is, ref is affecting our redistricting um, response, our state's plans for how we're grouping people together in new districts. Um, so while we know there's a lot of urgency because things are on pause now, a delay may not actually help New York City when we look at the long-term political impacts, um, which is why it's just so important that each of us is really doubling down into the work now so that once we are able to get back into the community, we can hyper focus on those hard to count um, and low response groups that uh, may not have been reached by the activities that we've done to date. Awesome, thank you both. My next question is, many people are displaced from their primary residences and unable to receive their census. If they are in their secondary home or quarantining with a friend or partner, should they register for the census there? How can one fill out the census if they are not home to receive their census code? This is a great question, and I get it multiple times every single day. You do not need the computer code to fill it out. 
You just go online to my2020census.gov. You enter your name and address. So that's the latter part of the question. The first part of the question is if someone has left New York City and perhaps they're upstate, say, at a, at a second home. So in this case, again, they need to be counted in New York City, not upstate, because their main home is in New York City. So just the mere fact that for the interim, for the short term, they are not in New York City because of COVID does not mean they shouldn't be counted in New York City. They are a New York City resident. They should be counted in New York City. And so the way that they would do that is they would go online or at the toll-free phone number if they don't have uh, broadband access for any reason, and they can fill the census out that way. Again, by going to my2020census.gov, just putting in their city name and address. It takes 10 minutes. Couldn't be easier. Um, or they can call the toll-free number. So we really want to make sure people understand that. And for anyone who is on this call, you would be doing a great service to the city if you posted that information to your particular social media channels, because that is probably one of the top questions that I receive. People either have left the city, they say they don't have their computer code, they don't have the mailing. If that doesn't matter, you still fill the census out and you're still filling it out for New York City. Thank you so much. Amy, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, that's great. Perfect, okay. The next question is, how are the homeless counted? Sure, so I'm, I will take that. So there are two different ways. First of all, as I mentioned in my presentation, we entered into an agreement between our city Department of Social Services and the U.S. Census Bureau to count the homeless that are in the DSS shelter population. There, for the first time under this agreement, um, basically, DSS is giving administrative data on every single person housed in the homeless shelters directly to the U.S. Census Bureau. This is really such an important positive step forward because it means that every single homeless person in the homeless shelters that are in the DSS system will be counted. Now, for the homeless that are living on the streets, there are three days that the uh, U.S. Census Bureau was pre-COVID going to be doing the count. Originally pre-COVID, they were going to be counting the homeless on March 30th, the 31st, and April 1st. That obviously needs to be delayed. So they have not indicated what those uh, three new dates are to us. Um, we believe that they're going to be in May, uh, but they need to have final con confirmation on that. Perfect. If you are just joining us, you can make sure you mute your phone. If you are not on a cell phone or on any sort of digital phone, if you can just hit star six to make sure that you're muted so we can hear the presentation. Thank you. Um, now, the next question is, considering all at home and many of us live in large apartment buildings, we can help promoting complete the count in our building. What's the highest resolution that we can see the self-response rate in our communities? In other words, is it possible to know the response rate sure. in our building? Sure. No, that's not possible. And I'm, so let me explain to you why. So first of all, we and, and anyone who wants to get daily updates, please, if you follow me on Twitter, my Twitter is Julie Menon. Um, I tweet out every single day what the self-response rates are by census tract. That is how the data comes in. It's not by block. It's not by building. It's by census tract. On average, census tracts are give or take about 3,000 people. Some are significantly smaller, however. But the, it, the data is by census tract. And so what we are doing every day is giving the data by borough, and we're going to start doing updates by certain neighborhoods. Um, so you can go on to the U.S. Census Bureau's website to see the particular census tract. But again, I really do encourage, I love the idea of people getting their building counted because that really would be doing a great service. You will be able to see how your particular neighborhood, your census tract is doing. And that will be one way you can see the numbers going up. But unfortunately, the data is not by building or by block. Uh, 
Amy, was there anything you wanted to add? No, no. Um, are there other questions or reactions? I'm happy to jump in because I'm looking at the chat and you've got other questions. So if you want, I'm happy to take them. Um, if Should I just go in order of how they're coming up? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so someone is asking, they're saying they have two homes, they've received the mailed invitation at both places. They are asking if they should only respond to one of them. Yes. Uh, however, let me just say, um, the census is a snapshot in time. It's basically looking at, you know, where you're living primarily. So if you're primarily living in New York City, you definitely need to fill the census out in New York City. Just because of COVID, if you happen to be outside of the city does not mean you generally are not using city resources. We want to make sure New York City gets our fair share. I mean, what I didn't include in the presentation is sort of the obvious, which is the importance of the census. We're fighting for our fair share of over $650 billion. So funding for our schools, I mentioned for our hospitals, but for our roads, for our infrastructure, for public housing, for over 300 different programs, it couldn't be more important. So we wanna make sure that everyone who lives in New York City is filling it out. Um, the next question is any guidelines for students formerly in dormitories? How is the census team working to count group residents that have been evacuated due to COVID? Great question. So basically, students living in dormitories are counted by the U.S. Census Bureau according to something that I mentioned earlier called group quarters. One of the things that we did back in January um, is that we uh, asked the Census Bureau to meet with us so that we could give them a contact at every single university in New York City. That was incredibly important. And we did that, I should say, January of 2019. We did that a year ago. Uh, so we started this process a year ago where we connected the Census Bureau with each university administrator so that they could do the count. Now, because of because that didn't happen, I should add, in 2010, it happened too late in the process. Now, because of COVID, so many students obviously might not be in New York City at the current time. That does not matter. They still will be coming back to New York City and they need to be counted in New York City. So just because of COVID, that does not change. In other words, those students will eventually be returning to New York City. They're primarily living in New York City. They need to be counted in New York City. And that doesn't change because of COVID. Um, okay, wow, we've got a lot of questions now. So I guess I will keep um, going. Uh, um, I can okay. take a, a recent one, someone um, asked about how they can take advantage of um, the fact that NYC public school students now have Department of Education laptops at home. Um, so we have been, as an after-school provider who both provides center-based programming and school-based programming, we've been doing uh, daily classrooms with our after-school participants. So it may be helpful to reach out to your contact at any of the public schools in your neighborhood, ask if there are after school programs there, who may be other community partners. Um, Center for Family Life does really great work in Sunset Park. I'd, I'd love to be in touch, um, Russell, so I'll make sure to share my email address at the end. Um, but I know that a number of after school programmings are, a number of after school programs are modifying their services and doing phone calls with students, doing webinars with students, um, and for CPC's programs, we are integrating census work into part of that as well. It looks like um, Ayana's question was actually the first one and it got skipped. Um, she asked if the census self-response rate has been extended, is there a plan to extend the grant period for grassroots organizations? Sure, I'm happy to take that. So the uh, as I mentioned earlier, and just want to make sure everyone knows, the U.S. Census Bureau extended the self-response period to August 14th. So, yes, our work will obviously, our offices work um, with all of our organizations will go to August 15th. But to be clear, the mayor has sent a letter 
uh, pushing, and we've really pushed hard on this, for the deadline to be extended to September 30th. That has not happened yet, so please stay tuned. But yes, we will obviously be working with all of our grantees through August 14th. I think for us, and someone asked a question about, will we be going door knocking um, up until August 14th or afterwards? I think the, the hope for CPC is that we're using this time in the grant period that we're in now to really build out our base of volunteers and build out our base of, of community members who come to us for services, but could be activated for uh, greater advocacy and civic engagement in the future. Um, so our hope is that we're using the census time now to really engage people, train them um, to go back out into their communities and be ambassadors for, you know, census this year and then civic engagement and uh, voter education in the future. Um, so, you know, I think there are multiple things changing, but our, our hope is that whenever the grant period ends, our base of volunteers is just, you know, carrying us forward. Um, I have another question from the ones that got sent in before. Um, it said, how do you assume the census now factoring in COVID-19 will affect rezoning of schools? And do you predict that NYC Department of Education schools with lower income students will be set at an even higher disadvantage? Sure, so I mean, right now we only have numbers in for, as I mentioned earlier, one and a half weeks or only one and a half weeks into this. So it's too early to draw any conclusions on the data. Our goal right now is to get everyone counted. Our goal right now is to surpass where we were in 2010, which I will say is a very tall order to begin with given COVID and given other challenges, quite frankly, that existed pre-COVID. Amy talked about the citizenship case. We at the city and I work for the city law department as well. We were a plaintiff on the case one of the big challenges that we have is that people still think the citizenship question, many still think it is on the census. And so that was one of the main reasons why we wanted to partner with community groups, why we disseminated the grants, because so many of the community groups that we are partnering with are really trusted voices in their neighborhoods. And so we need to make sure that we get that message out. But in terms of drawing conclusions from the data, in terms of rezonings or anything else, we're, look, we're only 10 days into this. We, we don't have the data yet in terms of where the city will end up. Our focus right now is pushing as hard as we can to get every New Yorker counted and to get New York City its fair share, particularly in its urgent time of need. Awesome. Um, I just wanted to double check because I did lose audio. Sorry about that that we answered people that were getting multiple census to different residences. They just wanted to make sure that they should only answer one census or if they should answer other ones sent to multi-level homes or vacation homes. No, you should, if again, this is a sort of a reasonable common person, um, common sense approach in terms of the census. So. The census is supposed to be a snapshot in time of your home. If you're primarily living in New York City, you are filling the census out in New York City. COVID does not change that. If you have more than one home, but New York City is your the primary place that you live, you need to fill the census out from New York City, even if you're currently not in the city at the moment. And again, I, I see in the questions that some people wanted me to repeat the information about how you do so. So let me just take the, the time to do that. You go to my2020census.gov, my2020census.gov. You can do it on literally on an, I, on an iPhone. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on the computer. It takes 10 minutes. You put in your name, your city name and address. It will say to put in your computer PIN number. You do not need the PIN number. You just click, I don't have that computer PIN number. And that's all that you need to do to fill it out. Awesome, well, I think that will be all for today. I want to thank all almost 90 people that came to this very unorthodox version of our breakfast brief. 
This is our first time doing it. I want to thank Julie and Amy for being so accommodating to the change in scenery. And I also would like to thank my team and Julie's team and Amy's team for just making this a fantastic event. This information was also extremely useful. We will be distributing the video from this event later. We have it recorded. So if there was something you missed, we will make sure that you hear it later on. And if you have any additional questions, Julie and Amy are both great resources for answering those questions, as well as the Citizens Union team, if you have any questions after this presentation. Thank you guys so much. I hope you are all safe and healthy wherever you are, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your week, and remember to fill out your census. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.